yourself. Great, thanks. Uh, hey, Scott, uh, congratulations. Hey, um, you know, you were a guy, you talked a lot when you played about how the game was hard for you. And I did not get the impression you ever viewed yourself as like a star. What how, What's it like thinking of yourself as a Hall of Famer? Are you processing that? Like, what's it just kind of like framing yourself in that way for a guy who always said, look, this game's really hard for me, man. Well, I appreciate you listening to me, actually, when I was saying that, because it's it's an honest uh, criticism of myself. It was very hard for me. There was not, you know, I, I tried to play with with as much max effort that, as I could and, and try to make sure that I was going to out hustle and out play and, and maybe out try to prepare, you know, um, as best I could. You know, hitting was never a real natural situation for me. I really had to work on it daily. I really had to grind through every at bat and you know, fielding became a little more natural to me along the way there. But to ask, answer your question about the Hall of Fame, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, to tell you the truth. I appreciate the votes and somebody thought that I was worthy of it. And I, I certainly appreciate that. I mean, to, to me to sit here and say, you know, that, oh, yeah, me and Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron. I mean, that's not real. That's that's not a real situation. These guys are, are true legends. And, and I get a chance to share that gallery with them, which I'm greatly honored. Thank you. Next question, we'll go to John Morosi. John, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, John. Thanks, Scott. Uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, I, I see you're wearing your E5 Foundation hat, and, and I know yep. how important it is to, to give back. And so, Scott, I wonder if you could share with us just uh, the important parts about the philanthropy that you've been involved in, Camp Emma Lou, Tyler's Treehouse, uh, the camps that you run. Just what can you share about the projects that mean a lot to you outside of the game? Well, I, I, I'm going to go to this. is I'm glad you queued that up, actually, because we're right in the middle of it. And Shesta, we were talking about, and I finished up some interviews um, about Tyler's treehouse and Tyler Frenzel. Um, he was a very special boy. And, in, in, you know, I met him when he was nine, and we brought he and his family to some batting practices. That's where the Tyler's treehouse came from. And his, his mother um, went behind my back and wrote a, apparently a, I have not seen it. I think it will be published a, a, a nice piece uh, about our, our relationship and our family and, you know, how Tyler and I be, became friends and, you know, outside of just, Hey, come on to batting practice, but actually had a relationship with our families and, and became friends. And, and, um, that was a, you know, I was, I was in a very impressionable time. I was in my, you know, mid, 20s, late 20s or whatever. And, and he really opened my awareness to a lot of things outside of just the baseball game and and maybe not just, you know, stroking a check and sending it here or there or just showing up randomly or whatever, but like maybe having an opportunity to take some of the some of the platform and things that I have and really dig a little deeper with individual families that are in some distressed situations. And, and he opened my eyes to that and the Frenzels did. So that's a, that's a huge important thing for me and my family and, and uh, to be able to not just to, to spread it thin, but maybe dig a little deeper and, and touch somebody. Thanks, Scott. And just one quick follow-up. Uh, what has your involvement uh, meant with IU baseball to be involved with Indiana University and how, how has that role evolved over time? Yeah, it's a um I don't want to over overblow the role. It's a it's a director player development situation where I can't really directly <laughs> develop the players, which is kind of ironic. But uh so so my time has been certainly more limited there the last the last year or two and and with all this going down and and we had some some health situations in our family that uh you know, I, so my my role has been been more limited and and I was kind of asked to demote myself because my son was a freshman playing baseball and I wanted to make sure that I could be around the the varsity the JV teams or whatever and not step on any infractions with the NCAA so but it's been great being around the program and those guys and you still get to go and see and play it you know at a little higher level thanks so much Scott congratulations sure. again thank you thank you Next question, we'll go to Trent Rosecrans. Trent, you can unmute yourself. 
Hi, Scott. Um, oh, Hello. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Scott. No problem. Um, appreciate it. Um, one of the questions I had was about, or, or really about your basketball career. And, you know, do you think that helps you on the baseball field at all? Could you describe yourself as a player? And have you ever thought, like, what would have happened if you would have gone through and played collegiate uh, basketball instead of going into uh, pro baseball? Yeah, I'll start with the last one. That's a very scary thought if I would have gone and played college basketball <laughs> instead of going into pro baseball. So I have no aspirations about what ifs in that situation. But um, I, I, not just basketball, you know, by itself. I I grew up, and, and I say grew up, but I mean competed. I played tennis. I wrestled. I ran track. You know, I was a sprinter. I was a hurdler. I uh, football, basketball, you know, baseball you know, everything around the neighborhood outside and the whole works, but I actually competed in like soccer and like club and team sports along the way. So I'm a huge proponent of multi-sport athletes and and not just, not just to say it, but just the, the mentality of, you know, being on a tennis court by yourself in an individual situation where you get tested and it's just you versus a team sport. Now there's a team sport aspect of it that you don't get by just playing tennis, you know? So so just without just the physical aspects of there's a lateral movement here, there's a force movement here, there's a bunch of different ways that your body gets well-rounded and hand-eye coordination. There's also aspects mentally that, you know, that, that challenge you in different, like I said, team and individual ways that I am just huge about. Uh, what kind of basketball player were you? I I was a well on my high school team. I was a shooting guard, is what I was. And on my high school team, I I played a little point guard, played a little shooting guard, played in the post a little bit. We were a smaller school, so a little versatile in that way. But I signed at University of Georgia to ultimately be a shooting guard. Thank you. You're welcome. Next up, uh, Lynn Worthy. Lynn, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Jesta. Thanks, Scott, for taking some time. Lynn Worthy from the sure. dispatch. Congratulations. Thank um, you. First thing I wanted to ask was just, uh, obviously, lengthwise, you had more of your career in Philadelphia, but I wondered in your mind how much of an impact the time you had in St. Louis had on your overall career. Um, you know, I could go on about each organization and the value you know, beach organization that threw me, I'm, that, that were on me. I, you know, I mentioned the election night and I truly believe, you know, the Phillies, I was so raw and so young there and it was such a great landing spot for me development wise, um, being in Philadelphia, the, the media in Philadelphia, the, the, just the numbers, the masses, and, and you get to learn real quick that if you're, you know, if you're not being upfront, you're not being honest and, and, you know, you're not telling the truth of what's going on. It's going to be a rough road for you. So, so real, you know, immediately you get a, just a sharp lesson and Hey, let's just be genuine out here. And we're going to take all of our effort out on the field every day, or somebody's going to let you know about it. And, you know, that's a, that's a great start for me without question. And, and, you know, we were a young team and we took our lumps team wise win loss record. So then being able to move to St. Louis with, with that, kind of in the bucket of how I started and how I learned to play. Um, you know, we were talking about Chest and I back in back in the beginning with the Cardinal logo on my hat. I, I really believe that my time there, uh, me being being able to be inducted, I think, is a reflection of the time of the my time in St. Louis from a, a team success point of view. I mean, we we my career kind of through the team and through the success, I think became a little more notable with two world series and, you know, winning one and four, four championships and, and just the, on the national stage and the team success, I think that that was, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that, that that's the part of my career that really speaks the loudest. And I also wondered this year coming back for opening day, um, throwing out that first pitch for you, was it any different? Did any any part of that experience feel different this year because 
you had you knew you were going to the Hall of Fame, and I remember they you know they announced you as you know an inductee, and there was this roar there. I just wondered how that experience, if at all, was different for you this year. It, it it was, and what was good about it is I didn't know what was going on until I got there, and I was actually standing in the wrong place. I was down by the Clydesdales waiting for the car to come around, and they had to shuttle me to the dugout. So it all kind of went fast enough that uh, I didn't screw any of it up. And you know, it's a it's an interesting. You know, you got Ozzy Smith there, and you have these guys, and sort of be separated and highlighted. You know, outside of those guys is you know I'm a little humbled through that like i i'm a little more comfortable kind of hanging in the group there but it was a great presentation that, that was the other part of that too is i wanted just you know to be highlighted amongst that group because of you know the timing and everything with the hall of fame announcement um how that felt for you and just how you handled all that yeah i mean you know back kind of the first question i don't i haven't really processed all this yet and, and again i'm not you know i'm i'm it's it's an intimidating group without a question and uh you know i'm very i'm very honored to to be in it and i i will see where you know i'm a pretty small fish in that pond right now in my opinion and that's that's a damn good pond to be in though thank you you're sure thanks lynn next up we'll go with uh derek gould derek you can unmute yourself thank you shasta hey so you Gouldy? How, yeah, it's me. It's me. Do, does it look like me? Have I aged? Are, are you in your limo? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm in my teenage son's car. So Beautiful. does it look like a limo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, hey, um, I wanted to ask you just uh, uh, with a week to go, how the speech is going. Uh, are you Working getting anxious and nervous? Where, yeah, I am. Yeah. Have you noticed? I know. It's on me yeah. a little bit too. Uh, You're breaking up a little bit. Let's, uh, Scott, you want to try and answer that question? I'm going to mute Derek, and if he comes back, we'll get him back on. Yeah, was that the whole question you think? I was pops and whistles after that. I think it was the whole question. It was a question about how the speech is going. Okay. Well, the to answer that question, the speech is going. I actually, as you and I have spoken, I have it on paper and it's a it's a whole interesting process going through it with so so many months and so much time and and between the election time and now, I mean, my life has changed quite a bit that I can that I can add pieces of my speech. But content wise, it's all it's all done. It went very well. It's, it's actually a, a, an enjoyable feeling once it's down on paper and you get a nice sigh of relief. I have no idea how it's going to be delivered, you know, but content wise, I'm I'm happy with with where it is. And hopefully uh, hopefully it gets delivered in a way that people have a clue what I'm talking about. And Derek, if uh, we didn't catch everything you were hoping, give us a shout. Um, but for now, we'll go to Mike Sealski. Mike, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, Scott. Uh, Mike Hello. Sealski from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, looking back at your time in Philadelphia. Um, you know, at, when you left, you were pretty adamant uh, about the your desire for the organization to to make a financial commitment to winning. And if there's anything you can say about the Phillies in the years since, that doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, um, I guess through the prism of all this hindsight, how do you look back at your time in Philadelphia? And do you think what's happened since might have people around here looking at you through in a new light and in a different way? Because it did get rough for you here at times. No, it, it um, you know, I, 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 have mentioned many times my time in Philadelphia, you know, right. If we, there's a, there's a three, four month period there that, you know, there was, I don't know how you want to say it, whether it was misunderstanding or not, we weren't on the same page necessarily important. And unfortunately it got a little public. And uh, I think we all wanted the same thing and, and it didn't, you know, come off that way necessarily, but my, my time in Philadelphia was fantastic. The relationships, that I made in Philadelphia with people in the organization I'm still close with my neighbors that I lived with for four years they'll be up 
they'll be up in Cooperstown and they're as good of friends, their kids and everybody as I, as we have. I mean, they're, they're some of our best friends. So everything, everything there. And again, as I, I said, I learned to play the game there. I, 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 there was a toughness there that, that you had to play with. That was a huge piece of my career going forward. So the, the financial aspect of the team and the kind, you know, that, that was happening at that present moment. And, you know, there was a stadium that was on the way and, you know, the question is, do you, do, do you, I commit, you know, at that point with, you know, two, three years down the road from a stadium and, and kind of commit your whole career, or do you see what free agent looks like? And that was my decision at the time. And I understand that the, you know, the Phillies needed to make a move. They couldn't, you know, bank on that necessarily. Sorry about the bank word, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there, there's no, there's no bad blood between the Phillies and, and, and me or my family in any capacity. I mean, they're, they're honoring me on their wall of fame this year. I'm going back in September. And, and, uh, that's a, that's a huge thing. I've spoken to John Middleton. And like I said, I still have a bunch of friends in the organization that we keep in contact with. So my time there, my time there, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, next up, we'll go to Andrew Chernoff. Andrew, you can unmute yourself. Hey, Scott, congratulations. This is Andrew Chernoff in Indianapolis. I want to go back. I know you've already talked about Tyler's Treehouse a little bit. Um, first of all, I, I guess just two questions for you. The first, what was your favorite memory with Tyler? And then secondly, what do you think Tyler would say to you today, knowing that you're about to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Well, I have no idea what Tyler would say to me, but he would, as as he did when we were, uh, he, he was the he was the type of kid when we had a charity event, and I was handing him an award, and there's 350 stuffy adults in the room, you know, raising money, and he and his friends, you know, went around, and he was in he was in a bad spot at that time, and he knew it, and they went around and sold his logo uh, of no limits on coffee mugs and T-shirts, and they raised a thousand dollars, and we were building the camp, and he's up there with me in his, in his blazer. And like I said, I have the microphone, there's 350 people in this room and he tugs on my coat right here. And he says, can I say something? Sure. <laughs> so he grabs the microphone and addresses the whole room and hands me a thousand dollar check and says that, that that check, what that check is for is so when we get the camp built that other kids will be able to visit and, and be a play in that tree house. I mean, that's how he was wired and, and that that spirit of of who Tyler was. So there's no telling what he had told me, um, because uh, I, th I think one of the stories that maybe came out is I went over to their house at one point and he wanted to play one of the baseball games, MLB, whatever it was. And we're down in his basement and he wanted me to be me. So that he could be Randy Johnson and blow me up. So there's there's some memories that we have with Tyler. So there was no shame there whatsoever. So, you know, it'd be I'm it's gonna be a it's it's gonna be, you know, emotional. And he's, you know, we we he's a big part of our life and he'll be he'll be there and his his mom will be up there. And so it'll be he'll be there, you know, emotionally with me for sure in our family. Thanks, Scott. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Scott, I did get a follow up from Derek Gould. His phone overheated, but he asked if I could follow up with this question: um, where you found yourself writing uh, your speech or thinking about your speech, um, whether it was at the camp and all the space you had there, or just basically where did you go for inspiration when you were trying to put your thoughts together? Well, I'm the dude that uh, thinks on the lawnmower and in the car and in the shower and you know all these places, so. You know, you can inundate yourself with a with too much going on and too many pieces of the speech. But uh, I also have on our our land here, um, I have a camp kind of a, a motor home and a little campsite over there uh, by the lake. So I would not afraid to go put my awning out from time to time and kick my feet back, you know, with a fire going. And my little man and I would go over there and actually spend nights in the camper instead of the house. And, you know, all that all that kind of gets some inspiration going maybe not like like you guys but uh you know when it's when it gets down to it and i have to actually put it together i'm always i'm always outside somewhere 
Awesome. Next up, we'll do uh, Jerry Beach. You can unmute yourself. Hey, Scott. Um, Hello. Uh, third, th third base is the is the least represented position in the Hall of Fame. And your path to Cooperstown started with getting about 10% of the vote six years ago. Uh, so I have a two-part question. Why do you think it's been so hard to evaluate third baseman? And do you think your entry and the likely entry of Adrian Beltre next year will result in a longer look and maybe a smoother path for current guys like Evan Lagoria, Manny Machado, Jose Ramirez, and Nolan Arenado? Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I know the history enough to, to be able to intelligently answer that question. I know that I, I, I know the fact that you were talking about that it's the least represented uh, position. And I, I don't know. I don't know if that's because people move to different positions from there and they, the actual true third baseman, such as Brooks Robinson and Mike Schmidt kind of went away there for a while. And there's a time in the game, you know, maybe that you, the, the, defense was was not necessarily valued and and they moved hitters over there or to left field or different spots so you know I think I think if it's evaluated you know just as a third base position as a true defensive position that's of, of great value in the infield and offense you know I think maybe there will be a, a harder look at it you know I think if you're evaluated as an offensive position with outfielders and a first baseman, you know, then, you know, I think that maybe that doesn't stack up, you know, quite as well. So, um, you know, Adrian Beltre, he, he can be evaluated any way you want, obviously. So can Chipper Jones. I mean, Chipper's out in left field, but, but he, he can be evaluated across the board any, in any way, but just the true third base position. I've always, I've always seen third base as a integral defensive position on the field. And, you know, we played the teams that I, was on the the success we had in St. Louis. I know Walt, he always built teams for pitching and defense and especially pitching and infield defense. And it was, we always took a lot of pride in being one pitch away from a ground ball double play and getting out of that. So, you know, I, I see it as a defensive position and, and maybe it wasn't viewed that way necessarily, but as an offensive position, which stacks up against some pretty heavy numbers in, you know, the other positions. And do you think that the guy, the, you know, what do you think about the current crop of third baseman and do you think this could kind of be a golden era for third baseman with you know, a handful of guys looking like they're at least starting a Hall of Fame path, if not already you know, well down there? Yeah, I unfortunately am not up to date on all the game right now. I've had a busy year here. And, uh, you know, I know I know Arenado is, is kind of on his own path as well, too. So he, he's be you know, my, my little man follows the Cardinals quite a bit. So he would be one guy that we pay pretty close attention to. And you know, when you start talking about defense and offense and putting it together, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a pretty special player right now in St. Louis. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have time for just a couple more before we hit 130. Um, next up, we'll go to Bob Nightingale. Bob, you can unmute yourself. Hey, Scott. Congratulations. Hey, Bob. Thank you. The, uh, you and Fred McGriff were you know, so alike as far as how consistent you were, neither were self-promoters. You surprised how long it took Fred to get in, uh, you know, never getting in on the writer's ballot? Um, I, I am, and that's not a criticism of the writer's ballot or the writers or the, you know, how, how the writers go about the process and how they see numbers and stack everything up. Um, you know, I, I can always go back to, Joe Morgan and Joe Morgan, how, how we spoke in Cincinnati and, and, you know, I credit him for this statement, but I like to use it quite a bit because it's exactly how I feel. And I probably, I probably said it before, but I'll, I'll repeat it as he always talked about as a player, you knew who you were, you knew who the hall of famers were that you were playing with and against every day in your era. And so again, not, not of any criticism to the writers or, or the process of any kind. I always believed that Fred McGriff was a hall of famer. Um, he was a, he was a guy, you know, dead in the middle of the order, you know, 492 home runs or whatever he had. I think I nailed it actually. And, uh, three, three, 493. Dang it. That was pretty good for me. 493 home runs. I mean, he's right there on the 500 club and, 
you know, played such a long, long career and was in the middle of so many, you know, really, really good teams with the Blue Jays and the and, and the Braves and everything. So I, I always had a feel that, you know, Fred was just a, a dangerous hitter and and right right there and was gonna gonna be in the Hall of Fame at some point. So regardless of the whole situation, it's it's an honor, you know, to to be inducted with Fred and kind of be joined, you know, as I know him, you know, as on the field and off the field a little bit. I've always had a lot of respect for him as a person and certainly as a player. So, you know, I think we're going to be connected for quite some time. And that's a great honor to be connected with Fred and his family. And then you get to know him much at all during all-star games or anything? Not, not a lot. I don't know that I ever played an all-star game with Fred. I don't know what the time frame was there. My first was 02. And so I don't know if we crossed paths there or not. Um, missed, okay. yeah. And and so you, you felt like <laughs> I felt like I knew Fred very well because he's such a pleasant guy. You get to first base, he's got a big smile on his face and talks to you a little bit and pats you. And when you're a young kid, he pats you on the butt and says, hey, man, great job. And, you know, so you feel like you know him, you know, real well. And I guess the reality is, you know, off the field, we've probably spoken, you know, just a handful of times. But you you his you know, his aura around him, you make you very comfortable and feel like you know him. Thanks, Scott. See you next week. Sure. Sounds good. Thank you. We're going to try and squeeze one more in. Brian Giesenslaw, go right ahead. You can unmute yourself. Let's see. Is that working? There it is. Got it. There you go. Thanks. Uh, hey, Scott, you mentioned you learned to play in Philly. You mentioned that in St. Louis, that was probably speaks the loudest about your career uh either now or down the road how will you remember or characterize your time in Cincinnati and also having just mentioned Joe Morgan do people like Joe Morgan or some of the historically great players and teams in Cincinnati what what part did those men or that uh that era play and how you remember and how you feel about the city and the franchise well, Cincinnati is actually the closest city to us where I grew up. There's three hours away. So, you know, we went to Cincinnati Reds games or you went to St. Louis Cardinal games. And and that was that was us growing up. And and so I I, I went and watched Barry Larkin play and I went and watched and, uh, Eric Davis and, you know, those guys in that term. So uh, I, I was very familiar with the Reds organization as well as the Cardinals. But, you know, Joe Morgan and, and you got – you know, Johnny Bench and the Big Red Machine was a little ahead of me, but I'm certainly familiar with it. When you play for that organization, you, you, you'd be sound asleep if you weren't familiar with the Big Red Machine and paying attention to what's what's around you there. Uh, with Tony Perez and those guys walking through, just, you know, huge presences there. So the, as far as my time there, um, you know, there's pieces of every every organization that are you know, you realize that they're part of your life as you're going through your career and your life and your family's building the whole works. And, and C Cincinnati hit me at a time where it was a, it was a new role that for me, where Walt asked me to be in a little different role. I wasn't a real vocal guy along the way. I tried to just get out and do my thing. And, you know, he asked me to just be a little, a little more vocal. And that doesn't mean I'm jumping up yelling at anybody ever, but, you know, just maybe, talking a little baseball and, and some awareness and passing, you know, a little awareness and things that I had learned from Philadelphia, things that I had learned, you know, from St. Louis, from Toronto and, and things that I had seen that I didn't want these guys to learn, you know, that, that maybe, Hey, here's some, here's some information of maybe how you don't want to treat people or how you don't want to do this, which those lessons are more valuable at times. So I think I got just to share a little bit of my career on and off the field with some guys in the clubhouse and, and I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that role and, and, you know, Dusty limited my day game after night game exposure. And, and, you know, so I, I was able to kind of maintain some stuff on the field where I didn't feel overmatched all the time. So that was a, it was a great piece. My kids were, were growing up. They weren't quite there yet, but I got to <laughs> really spend some quality time with them and, and they were old enough to come in the clubhouse and we'd eat some breakfast together and and hang out you know I wasn't carrying them around so they could get on a field in the uniform and and scurry around and and in the dugout and so that was a that was a special special time like you said it wasn't I'm not throwing batting practice my son on the field or anything at that point but you know they were at least 
at least with me and not in strollers. So that was great. You know, my daughter entering kindergarten and first grade and, and plus starting to play sports. So that was fun. And, and because of where you were in your career, uh, along with that conversation with Joe Morgan, did you gain anything perspective wise for where you were in your career from a Joe Morgan, a Johnny Bench, anybody else you interacted with when you saw those guys roll through the clubhouse? When you're in the when you're in the day to day, you just kind of try just try to hang there. You know, I wasn't sitting in Cincinnati thinking that I was going to be elected to the Hall of Fame. You know, at, at any point I was trying to figure out how I was not going to get hurt this next at bat from time to time, you know, and see if I could barrel a ball this week. So you're always in the competition mode and you're always trying to be prepared and, and, and not be outworked. So that was kind of the day to day that was there. It was never real of a, a boat in the future. You know, we could just, you know, Joe and I were able to just have some conversations. I think that were outside of me asking him, you know, should I put my hands here? Should I put my hands there? Should I put my hands here? You know, I'd kind of gone through all that in my career. And it's like, we got to talk about, you know, his take on Hall of Fame voting, you know, a kind of a, a different conversation that wasn't just driven on day to day success or whatever, because, you know, I didn't know if I was going to have it or not, but my kids are right over here. And, you know, that's that's what I'm doing today. And we can talk about the if the eggs and the bacon are good today. <laughs> Congratulations, Scott. Thanks. Thank you very much.